This episode is sponsored by Content Find, a premium video editing and content repurposing service for busy content creators, influencers, brands, podcasters, YouTubers, and marketers. Content Find provides unlimited end to end editing and repurposing services to help you get your video and audio content edited and repurposed quickly, easily, and reliably. Join other busy content creators, founders, brands, and marketers who now spend even more time creating while they take care of the rest. You no longer need to worry about spending hours editing anymore. Just create content, build your audience, and grow your business. If you're a content creator looking to save time and money, or looking to outsource your content marketing team, get your first free video edited now at contentfy.co. If you'd like to sponsor the SaaS District podcast, or recommend any guests that you think would be valuable to be on the show, visit horizoncapital.com slash SaaS dash podcast today. Thanks again, folks. Hello, hello, everyone. This is your host, Akhil Jabbar, and welcome back to another episode of SaaS District. In today's episode, we'll be talking about unconventional marketing trends, acquisitions of media companies, and scaling your marketing agency. Today, we have our guest, Neil Patel, joining us. Neil, it's almost been exactly one year, July 2020. Uh, if you guys want to check out that first episode where I interviewed Neil, it was episode number 21. Um, obviously, most of, you, most of you know Neil. He doesn't need much of an, an introduction, but he's an entrepreneur, angel investor, and business expert who specializes in SEO and digital marketing. He has co-founded a few marketing tech companies such as Kissmetrics, Crazy Egg, and acquired and grew Uber Suggest, and all, also manages his own successful agency, NP Digital. So welcome, Neil. Super excited to have you back on SaaS District Show today. Uh, thanks for having me again. I'm honored. <laughs> Neil, uh, love, to, love to catch up. Let's just hear, you know, what would have been some of the changes and improvements in, in Uber Suggest, Super Uber Suggest, since we last chatted over a year ago, I know one thing you mentioned in the past, like we talked a bit about conversions, uh, you know, paid conversions was something like 1% when we last chatted. Is that still the same now or what changes have you made since we last chatted? So I haven't kept up to date too much with our conversion rate. Um, the team more so does. Uh, I do know a lot of the improvements. I focus more of my energy on product. So we release a backlinks opportunity report where we show you all the people that link to your competition but don't link to you. So that way you can do outreach and increase your odds of getting links. Uh, We've added a lot more link data from anchor text information to where the links are coming from, the regions, all that kind of stuff. Uh, We even got more specific with things like, uh, you know, um, competitor analysis. You can see all, you know, there's a competitor overview where you can see all the keywords your competition ranks for that you don't. So we look at that as keyword gaps, right? Like, so that way, you know, more content that you can be creating. So we were just in adding more and more features to make the product more usable, better, um, give you, you know, better results when it comes to your SEO. The Chrome extension has been growing. We made a lot of updates there as well too. And uh, in November, I think we released our first version of SEO automation where we try to do the SEO for you automatically. And how's that been? So SEO automation, I know it's been on your, your checklist or bucket list for a while to test it out. Has it spun out as nicely as you hoped? No, it takes no, a lot yeah. longer, but <laughs> hopefully it starts working out and we'll find out more in November with the uh, first go around. Uh, but I believe we'll be there. We just brought in a CEO to run the division. His name's Max and uh, he specializes in marketing automation and that's all he does. Not like email automation, but literally automating marketing. And he did that for one of the big holding companies, uh, Dentsu Aegis. Very cool. Uh, how are you thinking about when, when it comes to competing with obviously the, the, the big players, right? The SEM Rush, the Ahrefs, you know, in the moment, they're, they're obviously the top players in the game. You're, you're coming in close on them. Um, how are you thinking other than features? I mean, that's, that's like probably like a, a battle that's tough to win against, right? Like competing against features. Is there other things you're looking at on how you're able to compete with them? Yeah. So we're not really trying to compete with them on features. I'm trying to create the most usable SEO tool that helps you get results when you don't have a big budget, right? So think about a SEO tool for SMBs. And eventually I'll, I'll go upstream towards enterprises, but I'm really trying to focus on small and medium businesses. 
And the key is, instead of giving them more features and more reports, how do you just do more for them? Because they don't have the manpower like some of the bigger corporations have. Mm. So I guess trying to make it easier and like more affordable, I guess that's your probably your entry level point of getting people in and, and then kind of moving up. Affordability, easier to use and automate more stuff so you don't need as many people. Like that's our goal. I'm not saying we're fully there yet, but that's where we're trying to go. Love it. That's, that's the vision. Um, when it comes to you know running NP Digital, I know many agency owners uh, like they eventually move to building a SaaS, right? After whether they hit a plateau in terms of you know where their growth potential is, or they hit you know uh, they get burnt out for some reason, you know, just managing too much uh, you know employees and staff. So after you know you've been running NP Digital for for a little bit, what are some suggestions maybe you have to other digital marketing marketing agencies owners who are listening in to help them scale an actual business effectively? Ooh. What kind of business? SaaS or agency? The agency part. Okay. So (laughs) when it comes to scale, the biggest thing I've learned is systems and processes. See, because agency stuff is very heavy human oriented, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a lot of people, it's hard to keep growing by hiring more people. It doesn't mean that you can't. It's just it's harder and harder to find more amazing people. The landscape is more and more competitive. So you got to create systems, processes, trainings to really level up everyone. Even when uh, you know, you're know you growing or you can't find people, at least you can hire younger people, people who aren't as experienced and really get them going and get them to where they need to be. And when you systemize stuff, create the processes, create the automations, it makes your team much more efficient. And hopefully you don't have to be as labor intensive, which then helps you scale more too. Yeah, and would you say like in terms of pricing and how you structure the different uh, you know, service offerings, do you like to go more you know, productized and you know, having specific services or do you have custom uh-huh. for everybody? Custom, no cookie cutter. You really figure out what's wrong with the business and then you apply it to that business. You can try to do cookie cutter. That approach works for others too. I just found that you can't provide them as great results because what one business needs is different in many cases than others. It's not as scalable, but it allows you to provide better results to customers, which is what we've seen. The margins aren't as good, but again, you provide better results to customers, which is what we focus on more than just quote unquote trying to scale up our business. Mm. So scale isn't kind of your your priority. It's more results, uh, getting you know good qualities, deliver, and and not even profit margins, right? It's just you know let's get good results for them. Doesn't matter whatever it takes. Mm. Exactly, and we do care about scale, and of course we are a business and we do want profit. But we believe if you provide the best results and you do amazing work, the other stuff eventually comes. And, and then I, I think from my understanding, what I heard is you've opened up your services to all kind of all size companies, not just you know the bigger companies with bigger budgets. Is that is that accurate? Uh, that's correct. We yeah. work with SMBs, and our average SMB pays us around three, four grand a month, um, all the way to really large corporations that can spend millions and millions a year with us. And, and how are you able to kind of manage those so many different kind of processes, stay profitable, and then you know split that focus and offering between you know, SMBs who need you know this much attention, and then you know the, the big guys spending millions of dollars. We have amazing team, great leaders. I think we're at 400 and something employees Okay, at agency. So a good amount <laughs> wow. of headcount, which does help as well. Nice. Okay. So just uh, getting the right people on at the right time, at the right place, right? Yeah. Bingo. Cool. You got it. Um, so as a digital marketer, um, I think there's a lot of noise out there. How, how do you kind of tailor your messaging in a way that would say distinguish yourselves from all these, you know, get rich Quick scammers, marketers who are just making, you know, the, giving a bad brand and name to the, the rest of the marketers out there. One customer at a time. The way you really grow in any business is you provide amazing product or service, you do really well, and you keep getting more referrals. It's a long, slow, boring way to grow, but that's really how most people grow. And if you can end up just doing really well from that aspect, you'll do well in the long run. Mm. So it's not. So it's even that noise is going to be out there. That those get rich guys are going to be, you know, flashing all that stuff, but it's not going to last. And uh, you know, if you do good work, it's going to continue, right? Bingo. Yeah. Um, so in terms of competition and maybe valuable skill sets, how do you say you know you can become a be- better or more effective digital marketer than maybe your comp- competitors or your peers? So you mentioned good service. Um, are there any key skills or qualities that you say are you know? Uh, they're differentiating among the best right now, you know, for yourself, for example, when you're hiring somebody, is there something that, that really, you know, strikes you as important right now? 
Not one quality. What we really look for when hiring someone, are you talking about hiring an employer or hiring an agency to clarify? Uh, employees, yeah. When I'm looking to hire employees, I just look for people who have been in my space for a long time. Whatever companies they were at, they stayed there for a while. They got promotions at that organization because it means that they were seen as valuable, right? If people keep promoting you and people who love what they're doing. Because if you can do that, typically you're finding really good employees because they have a track record of doing well. And like, let's say if someone's had two jobs over the last 10 years or worked for two different companies, and at both companies, they've gone continual promotions and they're the exact same type of person that you're looking for for the exact same role that they've already you know, been in the past, chances are they'll do a good job because they were loyal to two companies. They got constant promotions, which means that people found them valuable. And if they love what they're doing, They'll, you know, really go above and beyond for your customers or your, your clients, whatever you want to call them. And they'll probably do an amazing job for you because they've done it so many times in the past. Nice. And would you say the specific digital marketing skills um, that you look for right now? You say, or, you know, if, if, if somebody's listening in and saying, hey, like, I want to focus on a new marketing, you know, hack or skill set, is it SEO? Should I still be focusing on that? Or is that kind of old news? Is it, uh, you know, marketing uh, analytics? Yeah. <laughs> there, there's not one anymore. Marketing's turned to omni-channel. Mm. Whether you want to do SEO or CRO or paid advertising or cool video creation or UX, UI design, th- there's not one thing. And I don't think you need to be a jack of trades at all. Pick the one that you're most passionate about and just focus on that. You know, it's mm. like when I was a kid, they told me that you could be a jack of all trades, right? You'd be good at anything that you put your mind to. Mm. In the corporate world, you don't need to be. You just need to do one thing really well. And just harness all your energy on that one thing, and that's it. Mm. So, so don't focus focus on chasing the trends and what's hot right now. Just you know what you're good at is always going to be valuable if you can show your your work, right? Bingo. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, marketing and sales teams. Obviously, you manage both both those kind of uh, departments. So, you know, the marketing having to work with sales teams, or you know, even having to sometimes do sales themselves. Do you have any suggestions or tips on maybe how to improve closing rates from sales teams and whether that's a marketer generating, you know, better qualifying leads, or maybe it's suggestions within the sales process himself. So when it comes to closing, we don't really use a process like this is what you need to do. And this is, you know, with slide one in your deck, slide two, we more look at it as problems and solutions. What are the problems? Can you identify them? Here are the solutions. How can you prove that you've done it before successfully if you can? Show them projections, ideally, if you can, and break down what you're going to do and give away the farm. What I mean by that is show them everything that you're going to do and just be like, look, here it is. Here's going to be our playbook for you. And this is what we're going to do. You can either go try to do it ourselves or you can pay us and we can do it for you and we can do it right the first you know, uh, pass at it because we're successful at this and we've done this so many times before. And, and do you show all that upfront, like, hey, like these are all your gaps. This is what you're going to do, and this is exactly. Yes. And you and you take the amount of time and effort, even if you don't, you don't. There's no they qualification for, even if they don't sign up. You're like, here, this is all your problem. You do you do qualify them ahead of time mm-hmm. on your first call, right? You got to figure mm-hmm. out what they want. Do you think your company provides it? Do you think you'd be good at helping them? Find out what mm-hmm. their goals are, their budgets. So you try to qualify them, and then once you get to that qualification, you may have a few more calls in Avenci, assuming they're still good. Then you do a presentation. And you break it all down and you break down what you're going to do over the next, you know, six months, three months, 12 months, you know, two years and say, this is what we want for it. Nice. I love that. Um, I think, you know, you talked about this in your blog and your YouTube channel. And obviously people listening in, if you haven't checked out Neil Patel on, on YouTube and his blog at NP Digital, check that out. Um, but how would you say digital marketing is changing and has changed in the, in the last year? And I mean, what are maybe some hot marketing trends right now that people are maybe not paying as much attention to and maybe is less competitive? Uh, so the big thing that people aren't, aren't paying attention to that they should is, I would say, conversion optimization. So how much do you know about conversion optimization? Is a good amount? Yeah, a yeah, little bit. What's funny is when we're looking at all the trends and all the stuff that's going on right now, ad costs are going up, SEO costs are going up, markets are becoming yeah. super competitive. Conversion <laughs> optimization right now is the least sexiest topic but it's the highest leverage. The second thing that people aren't paying attention to right now that they should be is, uh, uh, what is it called? Voice search. So when we look at voice search, Alexa, all these devices, at least in the US and UK, they're very prevalent. And 
when you think about it, OCNC, their company that did analysis on how much money is going to be spent on voice search from commerce, it's well into the billions, tens of billions over the next few years. And the percentage of people was shocking. It was in the double digit percentiles of the people in the US and UK that have these devices that have already made a purchase through voice search. I thought it was crazy. I was just like, huh, hmm. no one's really paying attention to voice commerce. It's going to be a massive. So people are saying, hey, Alexa, order me a new toilet paper or something like that. <laughs> Seriously, they really are a lot of water and it gives you options, right? Because there's Google Home, there's Alexa. Yeah. I forgot what the Apple one's called, Apple Pod or something like that, but there's yeah. a few. Very cool. Um, so CRO, I love it. Yeah, that's kind of our, our first playbook when you know we do an acquisition. That's the easiest quick win that people you know don't pay attention to. Um, you know, headline on, on homepage being one of them. Is there any one or two others that you really like to quick quickly change to, to test out? Uh, email, any email stuff, exit pop-ups, collecting emails and drip them. Uh, I like taking the checkout flows and taking them from one step to two step. That's a, usually a quick test. Uh, sometimes that provides like a 10% lift. Uh, if you have a sign in flow, give them options to sign in with Google or sign in with Facebook. Uh, we found that that increases, increases conversions as well. Have you guys been buying a lot of businesses recently? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're an LOI right now of a, of a pretty big company right now, uh, based out of Israel, actually. Um, so it's been fun. We're, we're so uncon- unconventional. If you mention one kind of marketing company we're working with right now, it's uh, called Postalytics. And they do uh, direct mail marketing, right? So actual mailer pieces. And they, you know, now it's pretty cool. You can actually track it. You can see open rate integrates with your CRM. Um, I don't know. What's your thoughts on that? Have you, have you tested any of that stuff? I have. It, it can work out really well. We've seen it work really well in places like Australia. Uh, mm-hmm. The problem right now with the market and M&A is everything's expensive. Like, I don't know mm-hmm. if that's what you're seeing. Like, all the prices are just through the roof. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're not, you know, like this one, we're looking at something like a 5X AR. I mean, but it's, it's also growing like 100% year over year. So it's, it's tough. I, and I don't know where these people are getting these, these uh, information that uh, either there's just like a lot of buyers out there right now or there's but, just a lot of I, like 5X. ARR, are they even profitable? They're profitable, yeah. Okay. So yeah. they may have a twenty percent margin, but you still have to pay five X. That's an expensive buy. Uh it ends up being something like an eight eight X EBITDA, yeah. But um yeah, it's it's not too bad, just because they're growing, right? They've been growing like crazy. I'm assuming less than two million in revenue then? No, they're over I think they're at two and a half or three, I think. So it's actually okay. decent. Yeah. Yeah. Um so, you know, being a leader in the content space, I know I, we've heard this kind of saying, le- being a leader of content in specific segment is a sign that you're probably the leader in the space of all other aspects. Do, do you agree with that thought? And, and no. what's your, no? <laughs> I'm the leader in content or I shouldn't say I'm the leader. I'm one of the leaders uh, in content and marketing. Uh-huh. But if I look at marketing agencies, we're one of the smallest. Look at iProspect, look at Performix, Look at Tenuity. There's so many brands out there that are much larger than us. And you know what's funny? So mm. many of your readers or listeners probably never heard of some of these brands. But you know what? They're like, at this point, some of them like Performix, multi-billion dollar organizations like with 4,000 employees plus, right? So it's not, content is still not king? What, what, what is it that sets them as leaders? Or, or here's, have you heard of Performix? Performix, no. Is it? P-E-R-F-F. Okay. So I, I, I'm more known for marketing than Performix. Right. 100%. Okay. Mm-hmm. More people know me. I get millions of visitors to my site. They don't. I think they have like 4,000 employees. Who must be making more money? <laughs> right? Well, what, what are they doing? It's not the marketing. It's something else they're doing, right? Or it's not the content anyways. Good sales. It's been around for a long time. Old school mm-hmm. business, enterprise. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people who aren't well known that print cash. Yeah, I've heard of uh, a few SaaS companies now that I've, I've talked to who their entire uh, kind of growth, like 10 million plus ARR, and all they've done is just one, you know, one channel, which has just been like outbound sales, right? And they don't, they do like zero marketing. And yeah, it just shows you, right? That sometimes, you know, they're, they're thinking about doing marketing, but they're like, hey, we found something that's working and they keep just doubling down on it. They don't have to. So I know SaaS companies who people have never heard of that do 40, 50 million in revenue. They've been around for over 10 years. They get little to no traffic to the site and they grow 100% through outbound sales. Yeah. There you go. So it's and a- we're just like, what? <laughs> and then we look at all the ones that do content marketing stuff. We're like, oh, they must be massive. We're like, well, the guys who do pure outbound are like five, six times larger, even though no one knows who they are. So it's like, who really is winning, you know? Yeah. 
SEO, I don't know. I mean, is, is that still pretty hot right now? Would you still kind of focus on that? If I'm a SaaS company, is there is that Yeah, I think you need to do everything as a SaaS company. SEO, content marketing, social media, outbound. I don't think there's one right or wrong approach. I think you take an omni-channel approach. So that's how you win. Hmm. I agree. So you mentioned, you know, acquisitions right now. You're looking at some being super expensive. What what are you typically looking at? Um, you know, what's expensive for you right now? Anything that's like 10x or more in EBITDA. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's even uh is there a certain size you look for right now? Is there um minimum? We're flexible, ideally more revenue. Ideally mm-hmm. we want companies that are doing like five to twenty in revenue. Five to ten maybe? Cool. What what's your thoughts on the that HubSpot acquisition of the hustle? How do you see them helping their bottom line? I, I personally love the deal, but curious how you look at it. I, I don't know honestly, right? Maybe they have future plans or integration or I have no idea. But no, HubSpot's yeah. so massive. It, it's a drop in the bucket. They're worth like $27 billion or something like that. So mm. when you look at it from a financial standpoint, it wasn't actually a big acquisition mm. compared to the overall value. Okay. So still too early to say. Um, what, what's your opinion? Say, let's say you know, SaaS companies right now, typically, uh, you know, speak to a lot of them, they're looking to do uh, you know, smaller acquisitions within their same vertical or, or you know, kind of competitors. Uh, if a SaaS company is looking to acquire maybe a media companies as part of their growth strategy, what should they be looking for in terms of you know overall strategic alignment? Right audience. If you look at a media company just because they have visitors in your space doesn't mean they're a right fit. Uh, you really have to look at the audience. Who's like, is that your ideal customer? For example, if I'm looking to acquire a marketing blog, and they have so many small businesses reading them, mainly ones that are just starting up. And have no money, they could have a million readers a month, but I'm not going to close much revenue from that because all our customers ideally do in the millions in revenue already, if mm. not way more, right? So it's like just because someone has an audience base doesn't mean it's the right fit. And I think people really take that for granted. They just look at media and they're like, oh, you got all these readers, I'm going to convert some of them. Like most of them aren't your ideal customer, even if they're in your same industry. Mm. W- would you do some kind of test beforehand? Let's say you're looking at a, like a site like that, you know, early uh, marketers helping them start off. And then you say, okay, maybe there's something here. Maybe part of their audience could be good for my fit. Would you say, hey, let's run like an affiliate program or an email blast? Or what would you do? Create like a custom landing page and test it out for a bit? Surveys, talk to some of their readers, get whatever you can do. Right. Mm. Some people may be open to it. Some people may not. Uh, you could, if they're a media company, before you're interested in buying them, just try to buy ad spots. See if you can make the ad spots convert. Like you can do little simple things like that. I just sponsored ads on their on their site. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. What What are some maybe say three key actions you take after investing in a company to add value and help them thrive? So I know you've done it with Uber Suggest and a couple of others. What are maybe three things or quick wins that I that I always like to apply in your playbook? Uh, we don't look at it that way anymore. I used to more so. Right now, we look at how can it fit within the core business. What are existing customers buy that product or service? Um, can we throw our sales team and biz dev team at that business and scale it out? So we're in a little bit of a different model. We're not buying for a financial arbitrage. We're so more buying to grow our existing core business. Mm. Do you factor that in in the valuation? So you mentioned like 10x EBITDA, and then you're saying, okay, if if but if you know, they have the perfect audience and we know by leveraging their audience, we, we're going to get an uplift of, you know, double our revenue, for example. I mean, would, would you factor that in? Yes, but it's a little bit different. So our playbook is more so we look at a business and we say, if we integrate it into our company, how many of our customers and our sales teams and all that can we pitch and grow that other business? Because our customers are demanding what they offer and we don't have it. Uh Got it. So instead of you having to build it, you're acquiring that technology. Better, right? yeah, no, this way. And ideally at this point, we're not looking to buy something to fix or optimize. We're looking for something that we can bolt onto our existing business and take all our customer base and sell that services of that new business or that product. We're taking all our sales reps, all our biz dev people, and then go and sell that business and then go make it bigger. right? Because if our customers demand it, it's an easy way to grow. That makes sense. I mean, also at NP Digital probably has a lot more traffic and you can, you know, kind of divert them to different things to, to upsell them and whatnot versus, you know, a smaller company and trying to get them to integrate into your product. Yeah. 
Uh, is there certain things that your customers are looking for right now that you they've been like really you know hot demand and um, are, are interesting for marketers? CRO, we've been looking to acquire a CRO agency. We we offer CRO, but we don't have enough staff for it. So we've been mm. hunting for many months at this point. Very cool. So anybody in listening in who has a CRO agency, talk to Neil. <laughs> Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anyone who has one, please talk to me. Yeah. If you were starting maybe a new solution today in the industry, or, or I guess it could be starting a new solution, acquisition, or investing or, or starting up, what are some opportunities that you would tackle and see bigger opportunities in the SaaS or let's say marketing tech space? Uh, can you repeat the question? Funny enough, as you asked me that question, I reached out literally a minute before our interview asking someone if uh, to set up a call because they have a conversion agency. And I've been checking, <laughs> I was doing the interview and he's just like, ah, great to reconnect, Neil. And then he's gonna, what is it called? He, he's gonna set up a call with my team. Hopefully we can make a deal, but it's probably a okay. long time. I'll try. But sorry, go, go for it. Ask the yeah, question. I'm, 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 I'm good always luck. trying to do you're, deals. You're, no matter you're, what. I, I know. I I'm gonna understand. get... I'm good luck. I'm going to get you that. You're going to get that conversion rate agency here. That's right. You know, <laughs> seriously, sent the email before this interview. During the uh, interview, boom, got a response. But who knows the three? <laughs> love it. Love it. Wish, good, good luck on that one. Um, so if you were starting a new solution today in the industry, well, it could be starting up. It could be investing or acquiring just from you know holistic marketing overall perspective. What are some opportunities that you would tackle and see big opportunities, whether it's in SaaS or let's just say marketing tech space. So if I'm a, a founder and I'm, I'm looking to get into the space, what, what should I be looking at? Yeah, if you're a founder looking to get into the space, um, I would actually rephrase it. How much money do you have? Okay. And the reason being is depending on how much money you have, the solution is different. Mm, okay, let's, let's break that out. What are, what are the different, you know, what do you say? I have 100,000, I have a million, I have 10 million. What does that look like? Well, if you have a million or 10 million, I would say you get started by just buying. Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer. It's just like the easiest way to get started is you just buy someone who's already doing it and then you work with them to try to grow and improve it. Kind of like what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. You're doing it all day long. If you have less than that, you got to pretty much start it all on your own and start from scratch. Okay. I have a hundred grand. I want to start a, a something in the marketing tech industry. What's uh, somewhere that, that has a lot of opportunity that you see and, and should, should be tackled? anything that's digital right now has massive opportunity. There isn't one segment. We're all seeing everything boom right now because of COVID. Mm. But generally speaking, look for industries with low churn, even if it's service or product, it doesn't matter because churn is one of the hardest things to solve. And you know this, right? Like mm -hmm. you're better off buying businesses with low churn and growing them than you are buying businesses that are growing fast with high churn, but you got to keep putting more you know, water into that leaky bucket. Like it's just a hard model to right. solve. Hundred percent, yeah, super stressful. Um, being so, obviously, your CEO of a leading company has to be super demanding. You know, we said four hundred plus employees. I know you're not kind of too I'm involved the in day to day, so that helps. Oh, okay, well, that's true. You're, that's true. You have a, a partner who manages it, but you know, in general, how how do you say you manage your leadership success with with your team? How do you measure your own success? Growth, growth in our clients, growth in our revenue, growth in our team, learning more being more healthy. I, we look at growth from all aspects. Some mm. of it is mental. You need your team to keep continually perform well. Some of it is well-being, right? Like, are they happy working at the company? Some of it is your clients as an NPS score. Some of it is your revenue and your sales and profitability, right? I look at everything in little different buckets and ideally you want everything to rise. I don't look at a company in which you just need to optimize for revenue and profitability. I think that's short-sighted. You need to optimize for the well-being of your customers, your team, right? Without them, you have no business. If you do well for your customers, you'll keep getting more business. Hmm. Uh, so what what happens? Because I hear this a lot from you know other SaaS owners, agencies where they are measuring you know their kind of self worth based on the the growth value of overall of how they're doing and their business is doing. Um, and then they hit a plateau, and then you know they just get super frustrated and, and angry, even if they're doing everything right. And then, or they're just kind of flat for a bit, or drops a little bit for a couple of months, and then they're like, oh, maybe I have to start something else, or I have to build something completely new." How, how do you approach that when that happens? I approach it, and everything is like uh, little mini experiments. So I just look at it as not I got to build something new or pivot. I look at things as small changes. 
If you do really small, tiny tweaks and changes in anything that you're doing, you'll figure out directionally where you should be pointed. That way you don't have to revamp everything and throw it away later down the road. Um, so I try not to do big things. I try to do little incremental changes in a lot of them to help you get down to the correct path. Because if you go too far without getting taking a pulse here and there, you could just end up wasting time and have to redo everything. How many variables would you be testing on, let's say, on a weekly basis? So I'm just thinking of this. Let's say you're going to the gym, you're, you're measuring your calories, you're, you're measuring all your sets and your weights and your workouts and what time you sleep, all these different variables and factors. You know, you can apply that to your business. And then, you know, all of a sudden you hit a plateau in your strength, for example, if that's what you're measuring. What are you changing? You're changing your food and your workout. All of a sudden you're changing your entire workout. Or how, so how many are you changing? One variable at a time is um, one variable at a time that can affect another. So, for example, if I'm working out at a gym, I wouldn't change my food and my workout at the same time because my food can impact my energy with working out or my routine can, can impact, you know, if I pull in more muscle or I lose more weight. So I would do one variable at a time. But on the flip side, let's say I have a website. I'll test out checkout page and I'll change test my homepage at the same time because mm. there are two steps of different flows in the funnel, right? My homepage typically does not impact my checkout page and my checkout page typically does not impact my homepage. Mm. That's both at the same time. And unlike a human, you can do 50-50 on the traffic. So you can actually see what's <laughs> happening independently, right? You can't do that that's, with a human, sadly. That's true. That's true. That's, that's a good point. Unless you can split yourself in half. Um, you mentioned something about... What's happening to the checkout for all the traffic that never came from the homepage and how that converted. And then I can see it from the homepage as well, right? So I have two different variables and I can dissect the data differently. You can't do that with a human. That's only bad. <laughs> that's so a good with point. With many different humans in mm. which one human can change a diet, the other one can change a workout. You can have both change, another one change both at the same time. Mm. And that's the beauty of a business because so many different people come through your site. You can test so many things at the same time. You can't do that with one individual person. Yeah, yeah good point. You, you mentioned something in the checkout page where you actually said you saw improvement in conversions when you went from one, one step, step to two, two, two steps. Step. That sounds counterintuitive. I've typically seen the opposite where people say, shorten the cycle and get people quicker into the, into the, the platform or the tool and that should help. Why, why, is, two help? why is two better than one? Uh, when, when you don't have a famous quote-unquote brand, when someone puts in a name and email or a well-known brand, when someone puts in a name and email, they're like, I already gave you some of my information, might as well give you the rest. And we typically see that boost conversion rates. So would you put you know, name and email and then next full out form? instead of just going straight to form. We typically see that one. Not always, but typically. Mm -hmm. Smart. I like that. If you have you a really have... powerful brand, we don't really see it have much of an impact in conversions. Does it make a difference? We, we see something that beats all of them is like the one-click checkout. What I mean by that is like e-commerce, shop now button with Shopify. It's just so much more convenient. That beats everything, even than two-step from what we've tested. And the reason being is they can click a button, their other information is already pre-filled and they're done, right? Like that's just more convenient. I guess it's like Amazon, right? It's like, I know I want this, buy now. I don't even want to fill out my form again. Yeah, it makes sense. You already trust them. Do you have any, uh, maybe for your own self and how you manage your, your time, your, your, your productivity and all your, your uh, day to day, do you have best productivity hacks or tips for maybe founders listening in to stay more focused and, and, and on track? Get a lot of sleep. That's my big thing. I sleep a lot. I think everyone needs sleep and we take it for granted. <laughs> I guess when you have a child, you don't have a choice. You have to get that rest. <laughs> Yeah. Neil, what's uh, one piece of advice you wish you had known and you would tell your 25-year-old self? Focus. I did too many businesses in my life. I wish I just focused on one. Yeah. Is that, would you say you're doing that now better? Yeah. Yeah. NP Digital and Uber Suggest and over, overall that kind of a holding and is the... Is the Uber Suggest is owned by NP Digital, right? So it's just one ecosystem. Nice. What, what, is, what would you say are some of the biggest challenges you're currently facing in order to continue to grow NP Digital? Meaning what's keeping you up at night these days? Talent and acquisitions. We need to buy more companies and we need to hire more. Mm, just can't hire fast enough or, or good, fast enough for the right people, right? Yep. Who or what are maybe some of the best three resources? It can be books, it can be people, maybe, maybe you, people you follow or mentors who you'd say have been the most instrumental to your success over these last few years. Not one person specifically. Um, it's a lot of people who've been instrumental in my success and the biggest group of people would be my team. You know, 
I'm not the best at everything. I'm not great at most things. I'm only good at one or two things. My team's much better than me. They're smarter than me. They've helped make me a better individual. Um, and without them, I wouldn't have done well. Mm. Is there any any books you're you're reading right now or read recently that you really you recommend? No, uh, the last book I read was Principles by Ray Dalio. I spend most of my time reading articles on the internet. Sadly, a mm. bit too long. I probably spend two to three hours a day just reading. Okay, yeah, I mean it's a different format. It works shorter. Yeah. It's shorter to the point because that way I can just research and read what I'm interested on. Because mm. the problem I have with books is they're great, but in business, a lot of the strategies and the tactics that you read about are outdated by the time the book is published, at least with business books. Um, some of them are everlasting, right? Uh, not all of the books are, depending on what the subject is. But I've just found I've been able to dissect the information quicker uh, from the web than a 200 page book. Nothing wrong with the 200 page book, but I need the information as quick as possible so I can execute faster. Mm. I guess I podcasts are always good with that as well, right? I guess sometimes if there's specific topics you're looking for. I don't really drive anymore due to COVID, right? So podcast hasn't been as helpful, but it's still great. Mm. Sometimes I listen in the background while I'm working as well. Mm. Nice. Neil, what does success mean to you today? Whether that's you know personally, business, financial, life, there's no right answer. What, how do you measure your own success? Content. If you're happy and content with your life, you know, to me, that you're successful. In whatever way that may be, whether that's family or business or financial, you just need to be satisfied. And mm. you don't even need to strive for happiness because the problem with happiness is this state of emotion, right? What goes up goes down. But if you're just content in life, I think you're good. Mm. So content. I mean, it's hard to quantify and measure, right? When we're, we're, we're marketers thinking about, you know, how do you, how to value that? Yeah. There's no number to it, but it's just a feeling, right? You can't describe. It's just if you're feeling good, you're good, right? Yeah. 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 Awesome. Uh, Neil, I mean, this is, this has been good. Glad we could catch up here. Um, work, work and maybe our, our, our audience get in touch with you, learn more, just reach out uh, or just, you know, if they want to check out NP digital as well. NPdigital.com is my ad agency. Neil Patel.com is where I belong. Okay. Awesome. Thanks again, Neil. Really appreciate you jumping on. Take care. Cheers. Thank you all for listening in to this episode and joining SAS district today. Don't forget to leave a review and subscribe for future episodes where we interview top leaders in the SaaS industry. If you're a SaaS company looking to grow and unlock the true value of your business, get in touch with us at horizoncapital.com. And myself or one of our consultants will provide a free assessment to help you get there and hit your goals. If you have any feedback or suggestions for this podcast, please DM us on Instagram or LinkedIn at Horizon Capital and help us improve our content for you all. Thanks again and hope to see you on the next one.